We're back for another edition of Education is Fashionable, and this time we're covering Unit 2, Lesson 7, Prices as Signals and Incentives. There's just one more lesson to go before we finish our series on supply, demand, and pricing, and as always, we're going to get started with the learning targets. Just two learning targets today. It's a pretty short lesson. The first one we're going to do is explain how consumers benefit from competitive pricing. The second one we're going to do is explain how price acts as signals for economic activity as well as producers. First our learning target is going to get out of the way, so let's go. The higher the number of producers there are, the higher amount of supply there will be too. Some of you also picked up in previous lessons that the more producers there are on the market, the more competition that there will be. Remember that with competitive pricing, there are two goals for the producer. First, they need to still make as much profit as they can possibly make. And the second one, they need to offer it at a price that can lure business away from their competition. Also keep in mind that as a consumer, you benefit in two ways from competitive pricing. First of all, you get a better price. And second of all, if the producers of a good decide not to lower their price, then they will engage in competition with each other by trying to make better products. Let's take a look at some real life examples. Video games have always seemingly had competition in the marketplace. In modern times, we have two heavyweights with Microsoft and Sony, and to a lesser degree, we have Nintendo, which is odd because at one time, they were the superpower of the video game industry. But think of it this way. If Sony didn't have any competition, they could essentially offer any price that they wished because they are the only producer, and you would be stuck with it because where else are you going to go to purchase a video game console at? Also, without anyone providing them with competition, they would not be inclined to improve their product because, once again, where are you going to go for another game console? When Sony gets a competitor, then they have to start worrying about what customers might do. If it is truly competition to the point where the products are essentially the same, then the price becomes a big factor too. In the real world, Microsoft and Sony keep their prices at the same level because they are considered substitute goods, which we talked about in previous classes as well. Nintendo products are not exactly something I would personally claim as a substitute good, which is why they can get away with the lower price point. With Sony and Microsoft at the same price, they then have to work to get better products out on the market, market, whether it be through the games they offer or ultimately better consoles. This is why you have the Xbox One and the PS4 today, and I believe right, now, right about now you've got the Xbox One X and the PS4 basically ready to launch as well. Another real-world example would be the Madden football franchise. At one time, there were four football franchises, and some might argue that Madden games weren't even the best. 2K Games basically teamed up with ESPN to create an NFL game. They had a dedicated following, and to make things even worse for Madden, 2K was selling it brand new for $20. After that, Electronic Arts was motivated to make an exclusive deal with the NFL, and all of Madden's competition basically was eliminated. Many feel that because of this, Madden has very little motivation to work on making their game better because there isn't a legitimate competitor. You literally cannot buy a football game in today's time with all the NFL teams and pro rosters. Here's an example of what a business might take into account before they drop their price. How much of my product will I have to sell at my new price just to make the same total revenue that I did at the old price? An example can be seen here. In this case, we have a restaurant that sells salads for $6, and they're considering selling them for $5.50. They're going to do a total revenue test to figure out how much they will have to sell to make their original total revenue. In this case, I have to sell 28 because I can't sell 0.27 of a salad. If the company determines that they just can't exceed the original TR, total revenue, that they had before the price change, it might result in the price remaining the same. You can see examples of companies dropping prices all the time in the fast food realm, all in the name of competitive pricing. And I don't remember who came out with the first attempt at the four for whatever deals, but they became very popular very quickly. Now, this is likely because they are essentially all substitute goods for each other. You even see some of the lesser known companies in the valley of fast food giants trying to either offer a lower price like Checkers does with their four for three deal, or go the route of Hardee's who packs an extra sandwich into their meals. Also, Hardee's just came out with a new line of $5 boxes trying to get you to come into their stores over their competition like McDonald's, Burger King, and Wendy's. Learning target two, we're going to explain how price acts as signals for economic activity as well as producers. When there's a shortage, this basically means that the price of a good or service can be raised for the time being, and when there is a surplus, the price should be lowered. 
Higher prices can create an incentive for other producers to enter the market. They see someone else as being successful with a particular product, and they believe that they can be successful as well. Producers can also reduce their production in response to a surplus as well. This also provides information that it may be time for the producer to leave the market for that particular good or service. Think, they don't make PlayStation 1s anymore because the price was falling so low that Sony felt that it was time to leave the market for those products. They decided it would be better to use their scarce resources they have to produce something that could make, I'm sorry, that could provide a higher selling point and provide a better chance of increased profits. When a price begins to fall, it tells consumers that it might be the right time to purchase that product. Producers will certainly help get this message across through advertising and sales. Higher prices can send a different message, such as this good is in high demand and that there is a shortage. The higher price might also be trying to send the message that this is a superior product to the rest or can convey some sort of perception of being higher status than others if you purchase it. Take, for instance, the True Religion jeans that are pictured here. They sell for approximately $350, while the Wrangler jeans, which some of you in class have categorized as an inferior good, go for around $30. Some people might perceive an individual differently if they were wearing the True Religion jeans versus the Wrangler, despite the chance that the biggest difference in some cases might be some added stitching on the True Religion, basically used for decoration, and a different label. Now, people are guilty about that all the time, including myself. Like for me, I prefer a shirt with a Puma logo on it rather than another company with a lower perceived status, even when it's relatively the same quality. It's something I'm personally trying to get over, but just still haven't been able to escape yet. High prices may also drive consumers to believe that it's time to find a substitute good. An example would be if a favorite food becomes too expensive, you simply just try and find something else to eat. Basically, we're all done here. That's going to wrap it up for our edition of Education is Fashionable. Take some time and see how familiar you became with each of our learning targets that we were introducing at the beginning. And until next time, later on.